Hi everyone, Dr. Samantha Cotrera here, the Principal Storytelling Officer for the Histoire Source Source Story video series. A video series for Canadian history teachers, perhaps like you, where I get to talk with historians and archivists and artists and community members and a wide variety of people who are interested in history. And we talk about particular sources and the stories that they bring as a way for you to bring these sources and stories into your classroom to challenge Canadian history. We don't want these stories just to be like your kind of normal stories that you'd find in like a little pull out section of a textbook, but we really want these stories to be counter stories to the ways that we think about Canadian history in the classroom, the way your, your students can think about them and mobilize it for the present, and maybe have a new understanding of the future based on the stories that we're talking about from the past. Um, as always, it is so wonderful to have you as a part of the audience. We are wrapping up our series right now. Um, June 2023 will be the last kind of videos that we 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 show which is like a little sad which is really sad but it's been really really wonderful to like have all of these conversations so make sure that you not only watch this one but all of the other ones that have been able to really bring these sources and stories to life now, just a reminder that we do have a website um, and all of the videos that we do have a web page that has tons of resources that you can use to be able to think about and bring these sources and stories into your classroom. We're also on all of these different social media sites. So make sure you follow us, check us out, link us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And make sure you um, like, like and subscribe and share to this video along with all of the others. So other people will also get, uh, get these recommended in their feed. Um, like like I said, it's been so wonderful to to like get to know you and the community <laughs> through doing these um, these conversations. And it's so wonderful to get to talk to and meet so many different types of historians, even people who don't necessarily think of themselves as historians, um, and to be able to have these like, broad conversations about history. So like I said, make sure you check out this video, but um, others as well. Um, today we're talking with somebody who has a backroom, background in like costume and theater design, which is really cool, uh, costume design, which is really cool because I like the idea of being able to think about the past as a series of narratives that can be mobilized and through theater is one of those ways. Now, we're not going to be talking about theater necessarily, but Alana McKnight is a fashion historian in Canada, one of the only ones it seems like. And with her background in costume design, she got her costume design um, master's, I think, at Dalhousie University and her work as a historian in 19th century fashion production, she brings such a rich a, a, a array of experiences and like understandings of the past to this conversation. We're not going to be talking about costumes. And although she does a lot of work around corsets, we're not talking about that. We are talking about a 19th century source that that is so easily used in the classroom. It is such a great source. I used it myself when I worked at the Archives of Ontario and I developed their education program. And so I hope that you are using this source already in the classroom and that this, this conversation can identify some other ways that you can have those conversations. If this is the first time you're being introduced to this source, then that's great too. Make sure you mine it for other questions and inquiry kind of explorations with your students along with what we're going to be talking about today. So let's go over to Zoom and talk to Alana. I'm uh, really looking forward to, to like learning a little bit more about this area based on her expertise. Okay, let's go over to Zoom. Alana, I'm so excited to meet you. Thank you so much for participating in the video series. As I said to you when we connected before, we're coming down to the end of the videos, but I'm so glad that we have some kind of costume, clothing, women's clothing in particular conversation. Um, I have my cat here ready to go. I know you also are prepared with cats. So Yep. I've got this one might just be, walking there you through. Go. There you go. So we might have a very cat filled. There you go. Cat conversation you. today. Um, along with being a cat mom, uh, would you like to introduce mm -hmm. yourself? Yeah, I am uh, Dr. Alana McKnight. I am a fashion historian specializing in 19th century Canadian fashion production and uncovering the untold stories of uh, the women who worked in the needle trades specifically in Toronto. Yeah, that's really exciting. And when I introduced you before, I was saying too that you have a background in costume design. And so like 
like thinking about and doing that history of the women that created cl uh, clothing during that time, but also having that experience of making clothing for the stage as well, perhaps from those time periods must have been a really yeah. kind of interesting way to bring those things together. There's something about like the tactileness of clothing that you've been able to bring, I assume, to your history because of that experience. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, while I don't have the experience of working in a factory in the 1800s, I do know what it's like to sit all day at a sewing machine and with a room full of sewing machines and having that, that whirring sound and the, the dust and the pins and all of the things that go along with sewing. Um, and yeah, making the, the garments, I wanted to know more about the period that they were worn in. And I uh, went back to do my uh, my undergrad and master's in Canadian history uh, so I could really understand uh, the factors that influenced uh, the progression of fashion in the 19th century. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I am. Um... I've mentioned on the series a few times that I was a costumed interpreter of a 19th century, at a 19th century themed museum. And um, I did a couple costume workshops and it's just like to be able to think about not only the creation of these garments uh, or not, not only to think about wearing the garments because they're such a different way of like holding your body, but also the creation of them is mm -hmm. really interesting. So I'm glad that we are going to talk about the today. Does your cat want to be introduced? His name is Grizzle Greedy Guts. There you go. Yep. Yeah, we're a very cat-friendly series. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we have some really cool sources today, or a, a really cool source today. And why I love this source is because, like, we're going to talk about a couple specific things, but this is really like a model of using this source in so many different ways and to, or to be able to have this type of conversation across so many time periods, which I should just get to the point. So what is, <laughs> what is the source? The source today is the Eaton's catalog. Uh, of course, now Eaton's no longer exists, uh, but you know, when we were young, Eaton's was a massive department store uh, and they were the first mail order catalog in Canada. Um, not the first ever that the first was American, but um, all of them are available through the Toronto Public Library, through archive.org. They're available for free and really give a, um, a fantastic snapshot into every aspect of life for the period, for the year uh, of the catalog. Um, they had them in fall and winter and spring, summer, and so twice a year. Uh, and they had everything from clothing to furniture to houses. You could buy an entire prefabricated house uh, from an Eaton's catalog. Now, you said that um, it's not around anymore, but I just want to qualify that like our growing up childhood, this was not the wish book Eaton's catalog that we would have looked at. <laughs> no. The wish book catalog of our youth was uh, spectacular at every Christmas. <laughs> It really was. I mean, we should just do a, a video just talking about the wish book catalog. But yes. but um, but the fact that they do go back so far, they are so readily accessible. There's a couple different online exhibits on the Eaton's catalogs. Um, and, and it is such a wealth of information. I think it's such a great source. Mm -hmm. And I'm surprised that actually this is the first time we're kind of showcasing it in this series. Uh, yeah, it's uh, really integral was an integral part to the lives of so many Canadians for so long. Yeah. And we're going to talk about one specific story or a, a series of stories. So what is the story? The story is uh, the development of fashion in Canada and the moving away from women and mothers making clothing for their entire families to being able to order clothing pre-made uh, and creating leisure time uh, for Canadian wives and mothers, but also kind of the, the hidden story of westward expansion and, and settler colonialism um, and making fashion accessible to people in, in further west regions of Canada that hadn't been urbanized as much as, uh, as the east. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. And you have given us a couple like a, a spread for us to look at. I'm going to go to screen share. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so do you want to give us some context on these pages um, and and where it's from? Uh, and then we can kind of get into those big themes that you introduced us to. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a page, a spread from, um, you can see it's page three, two and three. So right at the beginning, uh, the catalog opens with dressmaking and ladies tailoring, uh, which gives you a clue for who was doing the shopping, right? It's um, the hidden unpaid labor of 19th century wives and mothers whose responsibility it was to manage the entire household economy, um, literally holding the purse strings for the family. Uh, they were responsible for dressing them themselves, their children, their husband, um, before they were able to buy clothing pre-made, they were responsible for making and mending clothing for, for their entire family. So the fact that it opens up right away with women's tailoring is an indication that this is the uh, their, the client that they're trying to reach. And it, it includes instructions on how to mail order clothing to measure. So we think now of ordering clothing online, we just select the size, hit uh, purchase, and uh, something arrives in a couple of days. In 1899, it was a matter of sending in your measurements so that the clothing that was being made to order made, was made to fit you. So it wasn't a standardized size, standardized size and just hope that your body fits the standardized size, uh, which so seldom happens. Uh, and it's it gives instructions for where to measure, what measurements to include. Um, and it the subsequent pages have um, textile options, trim options, button options. So you could customize what you were ordering. Um, the next page shows some of the uh, the fashions of the day, the 1899 fashions, and there are pages and pages of these with options to customize. But it also includes how to take a measurement, how you know taut the measuring tape should be, um, and yeah, there's uh, below that is the suggested trims. Um, so they're giving you suggestions about what would look um, fashionable. Uh, and these are things that knowing how to measure and what measurements to take were things that previously were taught to young women as they were growing up so that they would be prepared to make clothing for their family. But it by 1899, we, uh, they had gotten so used to buying pre-made that these little reminders were necessary to ensure fit. Yeah, what's interesting about this is that, you know, when you are talking about something that women in the household, uh, mothers in particular, wives would be doing in the household, it's really interesting because the the types of clothing that they list here are ones that really do invite leisure time, right? Golf co costumes, wheeling costumes, riding habits, evening gowns. And so there is kind of this sense of building leisure time, not only through um, not doing these activities of, of creating them yourselves, but also mm -hmm. in getting the items that allow, that invite leisure time. Like it's an interesting kind of, kind of, you know, collection of moving activities into certain ways. Yeah, and that really challenges the idea of what a 19th century woman woman's life was like. Uh, you know, we see these movies and shows that show a representation of the one percent, and they don't do much, and they're you know lounging around all day in their tight clothing because they can't can't do anything allegedly um but this really challenges one of the women in this photo is wearing uh, standing beside a bicycle for example mm -hmm. uh it's this very very subtle hint of a bicycle in the background there but um that was relatively new in the 1890s and relatively controversial as well um 
there was actually an article in 1885 in the Toronto Star uh, talking about a, uh, a woman from the east end of Toronto riding her bicycle around and what a what a scandal it caused because um, she was wearing a split skirt. Um, so we would know it as a wide pant, uh, but the split skirt allowed her to ride on a bicycle. Well, what's interesting, even just if even if you don't recognize this as a bicycle, because it, it could also just like be a railing if you aren't looking closely, that mm. her the hem of her skirt is quite a bit shorter than the other ones as well. Right. And so that's like just an interesting question mm. to ask students. Right. Why do you think that this hem would be a little bit shorter? Are there other mm. kind of attributes um, that we can kind of take from this? So when people did these measurements and sent them in, we see the Toronto address everywhere. Um, would this mm -hmm. then come to Toronto to be made in a factory, like the ones that you study? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they had a massive fast factory, uh, took up an, an entire city block uh, of, of Toronto near Dundas and Young, where the Eaton Centre is now. Uh, it was almost right next door to their flagship store. Uh, and there were men, women, and earlier on children working in these factories, um, satisfying these orders, and uh, then they would get shipped out. There was a uh, also eventually a Winnipeg store that opened in uh, 18, or sorry, 1905. Um, I should go back and say the the first Eaton's catalog was 1884, <laughs> uh, and Eaton's itself opened in 1869. So it was uh, it grew in Toronto and then expanded to Winnipeg and then expanded further uh, to the rest of the provinces after that. Uh, but the flagship store was in Toronto and the factory was as well. Well, moving to or having a different location in Winnipeg. Around the same time, only a few years away from the pages that we just saw, is quite interesting because that signals <laughs> that there um, that the popularity of a lot of these different mm -hmm. types of things that people were ordering in, not just women's made to measure clothing, but also the need for like a distribution center, essentially. Um, that yeah. is closer to the West. So you had mentioned earlier about things about Eaton's catalogs and Westward expansion and settler colonialism. Do you want to talk about that maybe a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. It's very much a story that goes hand in hand with the development of the railroad and um, the expansion of the land that we know as Canada. Um, west from uh, the location in Toronto out to BC and um, the railroad, the Canadian Pacific Railroad began in uh, to be built in 1881 and was completed in 1885. So right when the Eaton's catalog was launched and they saw this opportunity to um, s expand their uh, customer base by offering families in, at that time, remote areas of the West to be as fashionable as people in urban centers. And uh, before the Eaton's catalog uh, was published, there were you know, local shops that would, local dressmakers that would make clothing, or there were shops that would sell textiles for, um, women to to buy clothing or cloth to eventually turn into clothing and that takes up so much time <laughs> and if you're on a farm in Alberta for example you're responsible for all of the life on the farm as well and raising your children and having access to clothing that you don't have to make just changed um the lives of women, absolutely. It also goes hand in hand with the uh, development of the sewing machine. Before the 1860s, all of this was done by hand and including in, in factory work and ready to wear clothing happened because of the sewing machine, because it 
suddenly more clothing could be produced faster. And that's why we have fast fashion today. It sort of um, went past the logical conclusion and into uh, dystopian horror. <laughs> Um, that's an interesting discussion point for for students mm -hmm. in the classroom too right to like think about the types of the ways that we that we buy clothing today and how to kind of think about that trajectory but then you know one yeah. thing that I'm that really comes to mind when you're talking about westward expansion and like the you know the measurements and ready to make clothing and also the factories is that really it seems like the development of these clothings and the the and like advertising it through something like a catalog really also develops a particular class structure uh, and and re reaffirms it and reiterates it by saying like yeah i mean don't worry you can have a riding outfit you can have an evening gown um you don't need to do it we have other people to do it and if you are yeah. wearing these evening gowns you can kind of think of your life separate from the farm work that you're doing and can start representing settler colonialism in your small little settlement out west as we try to make it bigger <laughs> through the through the reserve system and through the the railroad like to me, mm -hmm. this, this, like, I, all I can think of is, is class and the way the class cl and class divisions um, start being shown through clothing and also the production of clothing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. It was um, very much a middle-class uh, phenomenon. Uh, if you were of the upper wealthy class, you were probably not shopping at Eaton's, you were probably having your dressmaker make clothing for you, or you would get stuff while you were on the continent um, or in New York. Um, because, you know, Canada has, is not particularly seen historically as the, the central fashion, fashion. mecca. Um, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, if you were wealthy, you might go to London or Paris for the season, and you would come back with your trunks filled with um, the hottest fashions available. Uh, if you were lower than middle class, you might be buying secondhand. You might be um, it, you might be getting hand-me-down clothing from uh, your employer. That happened a lot with domestic servants, where uh, the clothing would be passed down from the the mistress to the servant. Uh, you might also be um, reworking the clothing that you had to be more fashionable or to fit into um, the styles of the day. Um, yeah, the, it definitely harkens to this, the growth of the middle class in Canada uh, and perpetuating whiteness, really, um, and the ideal white European body uh, and beauty standards that are still uh, very much in play today, despite the fact that there were Indigenous many Indigenous peoples in, in the West, as the expansion happened, who were uh, forced into this Anglo-centric clothing, Euro Eurocentric clothing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, um, it's interesting. There's a book, you probably have seen it on social media, that it's about to be published or will be just published when the time this is out, about um, like plus size clothing and about and like the creation of plus size clothing as a catalog, as a, as a category, mm -hmm. because when you were doing made to measure, it was just your measurements. It wasn't a particular separate category. And so the ways that bodies get created through fashion and even yes like perhaps those corsets that we saw um i'll go back to screen share um are not particularly um tight or uh, immobile someone that's on a bicycle mm -hmm. could still be wearing a corset we can still see here that there is a particular um body shape that's being produced through the clothing itself um yeah just through the silhouette of the skirt <laughs> along with the the tightness of the of the little the jacket on top to be able to mm. to showcase the waist and how that changes over time too right these fashions yeah. would have looked so different when the first catalog came out and and you know five years down the line too 
because it is uh, the kind of norm of femininity is shaped by these things. Yeah, absolutely. In the 1880s, uh, from the the images I've seen from uh, of fashion, the arms were often um, fleshier than mm-hmm. what's displayed here, uh, for example. And um, yeah, the uh, the whiplash that women have always had from trying to keep up with these impossible body standards set through fashion um, have, is, has always been present. Mm-hmm. You know, one year uh, in the research that I've done, the Toronto Star gives fashion advice at, at around 1899. One year saying, you know, it's time to lose weight, skinny is in, and the next year it's, you know, start gaining weight we want fleshy women again so it's you know one one year to the next you you can't keep up and you just can never do right in through right what's required in fashion right and that's such an important conversation too i know a lot of teachers teach this time period in um like um upper middle school grade seven grade eight and you know uh to be able to have these conversations about societal pressures and women's bodies and men's images too but it is, it's a, it's less of a, um, it's less of a kind of a broader conversation, perhaps, um, I think is really kind of interesting to think like if you were riding a bicycle or you were going to be riding, um, like a, a horse, are these the types of clothing that you wanted to wear? Um, mm-hmm. when we're thinking about the creation of this type of fast fashion, um, for the 19th century, not for today's standards. Were there certain elements that were, I guess were like privileged through the catalog as a way to make it um, easier or perhaps faster or more efficient on the production side? Um, There were some corners that were cut, uh, but there was a lot of, um, you know, linings were still put in by hand. and a lot of tasks that were considered more um, difficult were often the responsibility of tailors and men. Uh, And the young women did a lot of the um, more uh, conveyor belt style, um, doing the same seam all day, every day. Uh, This division of um, skilled versus unskilled labor within the factory was Mm -hmm. very interesting uh and it also speaks to um a phase of immigration to canada from eastern europe where uh skilled tailors who are men immigrated to canada and worked in these factories um doing this more skilled labor and uh the the women who arrived with them we're often doing the unskilled, quote unquote, unskilled labor. Now, I know, um, I know when I've been to, I've seen a couple exhibits related to like home piecemeal work. Was that the case with something like, with something like the Eaton's catalog? Or was it mainly factory work as a way to keep the control and to be able to ensure production? Yeah, that's a very interesting line of inquiry. Um, <laughs> no pressure. Work. No, it's it's really, um, it did happen in Toronto, in Canada, but because it was unregulated, uh, it was a way for factory owners to undercut uh, female labor because the home workers were paid less. But it's hard to pinpoint and say, yes, absolutely, Eaton's did this because it was basically done cloak and dagger style. Mm. It was unregulated. It wasn't really tracked. Um, It was exploitative. And uh, there are just unfortunately not a lot of records um, because I think even the factory owners knew that they were doing something incredibly shady. Um, But homework, uh, just to explain what that is, is when a factory will have outsourced the factory work to people at home. So women who weren't able to go to a job every day for 12 hours because they have family, they have children to look after, 
or elderly family to look after, and they have to be in the home, but still earn an income. So the factories would send them bundles to work on at home. And often this was children's first exposure to work. They would snip threads, they would sew buttons on, they would do smaller, smaller work. And the entire family often would get involved in uh, this outputting system. Yeah, there, I mean, the reason why I thought of that is when you were talking about immigrant men in particular, and like um, uh, often their wives or daughters or sisters participating in kind of unskilled labor. And I think it's important that we always put quotes around unskilled labor because there's a lot of um, skills in unskilled labor that someone like myself and like you with multiple degrees could not do. Um, there was like an exhibit at the Tenement Museum in New York, and they were talking yes. specifically about one family. Um, they were showcasing one family um, in this this little tour that we did, and they were talking about a particular immigrant family in which the father would bring home piecemeal work for um, his wife and like all of his children, <laughs> and like. And that kind of collection. So when you said that, it just made me think of that kind of system. And, um, and I, you know, that system is often represented in movies too, that I want, I want to want to know the connection. If, yeah, if absolutely. Yeah. I, I saw that exhibit at the Tenement Museum as well, and it was spectacular and yeah. um, not to go too far off of Canadian history, but one of the daughters was working at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory when the fire happened. Interesting. If I remember correctly. Yeah. So, um, and it should also be noted that it's the outputting system is still happening today <laughs> uh, and it continues to exploit immigrant women. Um, and we don't think of, because most of our fashions are created overseas where it's out of sight, out of mind, we don't have to think about it, but there is still clothing production in Canada and, uh, it is still um, exploitative of newcomers who have these skills that they've developed uh, early on in life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, again, I think that connecting young people's experiences with fashion and clothing and consumerism around that to the Eans catalog and to the conversations about production that you can see through the Eaton's catalog is, is a really mm -hmm. valuable way to get start students thinking about the future and their own responsibility um, in, in this system, in this capitalist system we have in, related to, to fashion. Yeah. And it wasn't, you know, the, these women weren't ordering a dress a week. This would be, you know, a, a dress for the season. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I know, we hear so often of people now who proudly say they never wear the same outfit twice, which means that they are consuming at an, an like a wild rate um, and disposing at the same rate. Uh, fashion then was made with natural fibers. They weren't synthetic yet, but now it's polyester mostly, and that doesn't break down. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the quality is not something that you can rework and make into something new, whereas the quality in 1899 was good enough that you could repair and mend and continue to wear and rework as the fashions change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I think too that even just thinking about the types of fabrics, um, in the series that I did in 2020, one of the last conversations that we had talked about the importance of getting students to think historically as well as in the present about all of the different connections that one item has. And if we think about, for example, um, natural fibers such as cotton, right, that we can link that to systems of enslavement in the United States, for example, um, and other really exploitative ways to generate those to generate those fabrics and to be able to just kind of yeah. think about how that one thing has these large interconnections of labor and capitalism and colonialism and white supremacy and patriarchy as a way to to think really critically about our own connections within these histories like nothing hmm. nothing lives on its own they're all matrix of matrices of connections 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, with cotton, it's not just a human exploitation, it's an environmental exploitation. It takes a lot of water mm -hmm. to produce cotton. And often cotton is grown in countries that have droughts. So the water is diverted away from human need for survival to manufacturing consumer products. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there was silk on there as well. And silk has a long history uh, with trade in from Asia. Um, sheep, Canada has sheep covered. We can produce our own <laughs> wool, <laughs> famously have. Um, but with these other fibers that don't, that can't be produced here, um, that we just don't have the climate to grow the mulberry trees, to grow the silkworms or the correct uh, climate to grow cotton plants that needs to come from somewhere else. And that somewhere else might have more questionable human mm -hmm. uh, laws, laws around human ethics than Canada does. So historically, Canada uh, has had some issues with human ethics. I would like to just say that, and we still do. So I'm not absolving Canadian history of questionable human ethics. Um, that are the the transatlantic slave trade did touch Canadian shores absolutely yeah definitely um I mean it wasn't uh we didn't have large cotton plantations but enslavement was definitely a factor here as well and I think that to be able to understand our own to be able to understand how we can position ourselves within those ex ethics historically and in the the present and the future I think is important so our last question in the series, is how can we use this to challenge Canadian history, to be able to bring in new challenging counter stories to what we often um, encounter in a history classroom or a, a history textbook? Because I know teachers do a really great work in the classroom, but our, you know the textbook is <laughs> such a, a an anchor um, for a lot of people. So how can we use this to challenge Canadian history? And when I say this, like it could be the Eaton's catalog, it could be, you know, the, the, the images that you were showing us about measuring and those particular women's clothing, it could be the kind of connections that we've talked about. Um, any, any thoughts as we, as we wrap yeah, up I, as a conclusion? I can remember taking Canadian history as I did all through high school and anytime Eaton's catalogs were brought up it was in sort of the humorous it was used in outhouses kind of way right. as a replacement for toilet paper like it had that secondary use um which you know it's funny to teenagers but it has such a, a broader story of uh that can retell the lives of the people who really did the the heavy lifting in um in their families and in communities that were uh, expanding in the West. And that is the the women and wives of the families who, you know, even just through the act of marrying, they were erased as people, you know, in the directories after their husbands died, they would be, you know, Mrs. William Smith, bracket widow. So she didn't even have her name anymore. It was just her husband's name and she was his widow, but they, the catalog has the opportunity to make students think about the roles, these gen very gendered roles uh, of within the family community um, and how that has progressed now. And, and that we know families can be anything. Um, come, they come in all shapes and sizes and all genders, uh, gender expressions, but it was very much this gendered binary of man and wife, even that, like, it's not man and woman, it's man and his wife. Uh, and that they really, the women were the ones holding the family together, making sure everyone was dressed, making sure that the family's budget was used appropriately. Um, it's also an interesting opportunity for students to think about how bodies were in the past and the, the changing uh, expectations of bodies um, and the imposition of very narrow 
expectations of what bodies should be uh, from you know thinness to whiteness uh, and how those ideas expanded west with the railroad and with the catalog. Um, it's interesting because one of the very first talks that we did in this series with, was with Dr. Madeline Mant, who is a historical uh, anthropologist and we were talking about talking about the bodies in the room and um, I love this idea of being able to think about the like think about the body and think about um, people's experiences in those bodies in those time periods by looking at the catalog and um, mm -hmm. and uh, and like the the expectations of things like class, of things like gender, of things like colonialism um, on the body during that period and the kind of ramifications or repercussions of that as well. Like, I think, yeah, that's so, that's so interesting. Thank you. Yeah. I also think it's an important lesson in uh, paid women's labor that sewing clothing in factories was one of the only ways women could earn a wage. Uh, their options were so limited. Uh, it was basically domestic service, teacher, nurse, or seamstress. Those, those were often the options available. So through the development of factory-made clothing, women had the opportunity to earn a wage and contribute to their family and uh, economies. Yeah. And what that means when there is, when there is, for example, immigration, when there is young people, when they're like, and what does that mean to your future prospects? If you're going from, you know, 15 right into a factory and what does that look like to your life? And yeah, thank you so much. This was really, really great. I'm so glad that this is, that we've been able to include this in the series. Um, how can people get in touch with you, Alana, if they have more questions about um, fashion during this time period or about the production of fashion during this time period? Yeah, I'm on Instagram at dr.mcknight.fashion. Uh, I'm on Twitter at alana.mck. Um, or and that is me that has showed up below through the magic of editing. People can see that on the screen already. <laughs> uh, and you can also email me at alana.mcknight at tmuniversity.ca. I think that's the new email address. Okay. Formerly Ryerson. Yeah. <laughs> that's also on the screen, uh, the correct version on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for considering fashion as being uh, a vital part of history as well. Um, it's, it's part of everybody's life, whether they know it or not. And, uh, and it always has been. Um, it's a very, uh, loaded topic uh, and it often gets overlooked in the uh, discussion of Canadian history. Well, I, I definitely think it gets overlooked in Canadian history because when I did that call out, I was like, who does fashion history? And everybody said your name, which is so wonderful because mm -hmm. it all just comes to you, but then it all just comes to you. And it's interesting that there isn't more discussion about fashion in Canada because of, I think, the ways that it does flag the creation of class systems and settler colonialism and the the ways that it kind of structured those things when mm. um a lot of people were doing farming you can't ride a, well i guess you can ride a bicycle but that's a leisure activity and so how do all those things that get created and I, that's why i love the fact that we did this particular time period but it is such a key key element and as somebody who has a background in women's studies and history. I also know that when we talk about fashion, we can't help but talk about women and women's experiences. Women's experiences in so many different ways. And so I'm just so glad that we were able to include this. Wonderful. Thank you so yeah. much. And I'm glad that our cat somewhat behaves. See, we have two <laughs> sets of ears here. I know that you have a second cat and I do as well. Yep. They haven't shown up, but they are here in spirit. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Alana. It was so wonderful to meet you. It was wonderful to have your cat here as well. And uh, let's stay in touch. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Bye.